Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. It's Sunday, March 20th, 2022. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. Oh, and that makes me Gary. Don't hurt nobody with your bad self. Welcome to Comes Out Live, the Bear Podcast. It's been determined like episode number 640. And Damon's currently on assignment. Where's Damon currently on assignment at, Gary? Detroit, Michigan. Oh. The The Motor Motor City. City. Yes. He'll have some reconnaissance to report back soon. And in the meantime, we have Edward Angelini Cook with us. Yay! 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 Applause loaded up because I had to do things. Anyways, that's beside the point. We're here again for another one of those shows. It's time for another Landscape of Relationships episode. Gary, what are we talking about? Um, well, we were going to talk about something else. Um, and then I asked Ed if we can switch up the topic. Um, because, uh, I don't know how to explain. So I've, um, I've been highly like introspective recently, I guess, um, to give a little bit of context and background so folks can kind of understand, um, and and so I'm going to own it up front. This episode is kind of um, me requested specific. Um, and it'll make more sense in a little bit. So uh, back on March 7th, um, we uh, learned and or soon after learned of the passing of um, a podcaster in the bear community. And his name is Brian Hill. Um, he was part of the 619 Bearcast out of San Diego, California. Um, they had a short uh, few years run um, and actually had come back during the pandemic and had done a couple of uh, video type episodes um, just as a catch up because they had done it for about five and a half years. And then they took a break or ended uh, around 2014, if I remember correctly. And then they came back about six years later in 2020. Um, so um, I knew Brian. And, um, Brian, I knew Brian before I thought I knew Brian. Um, he had run a website way back in the day called King for a day. Um, that was F U R for fur. And so it was this kind of website thing where somebody's picture just got posted on there. And this was in the beginning of the internet, like, um, before Tumblr, before Twitter, like, and it wasn't necessarily porn, but, um, it was, it was like in a whole different time of our lives. I mean, it's, you know probably 20 years ago or more. So long story short, um, in 2011, I had gone out to San Diego, California as a gift um, reward to myself. Um, I had been diagnosed with colon cancer in 2010 and um, had been, uh, had surgery and um, long story short, you know, was fine afterwards. And so a year later, I uh, decided I wanted to do a big trip for myself. So I went out there and um, lo and behold, I met the host of the 619 Bearcast along with some other fabulous people and I have one of the best weekend memories of my entire lifetime being out there. And so I followed a lot of the people that I've uh, stayed in touch with out there over the years with the plan to go back at some point. Um, so I've known about, you know, what's been going on with Brian, um, his health over the past few years. He um, uh, was diagnosed with multiple myeloma um, after having, uh, I believe it was a form of a different form of a cancer. And um, so he'd been on and off with stuff. He'd had COVID. He was in the hospital, um, but he was doing pretty decent. And then apparently he took a, a pretty um, turn uh, not for the best. And, um, after about two weeks, 
um, his family and his fiance Joey made the decision that that was going to be it. Um, and it's been pretty devastating to quite a few people that have ever met him. So, um, in part of this like grief process for myself, I've been like kind of paying attention to certain things and how I feel about stuff. And one of them was, I was thinking about his fiance and how like, he is in his late twenties. Um, I don't even think he's uh, thirty. Brian was my age, and what I was thinking about in all of this was Joey has his the rest of his life ahead of him, and is now widowed um, in one viewpoint. And I started thinking about all the people that knew and loved Brian, and how he has like this whole family, this whole chosen family um, that is going also through grief, but is also like here for him um, to be supportive in whatever he decides to do and what comes next. And the whole future is completely unknown. Um, you know, if he has an average, you know, U.S. Uh, median life, you know, expectancy, he's got a, like maybe another 60 years. Um and that's really important because, you know, he most likely will um, develop other relationships um, and do other things in his life than, you know, the, I think, six years that they were together. So that was kind of what was on my mind. Hence, I reached out to Ed and was like, hey, for this month, could we swap the topic and talk about chosen family? Because I think it's important that we recognize that these are relationships that exist in our lives and they're kind of unique to us um, in the LGBT plus community, or at least we tend to think so. Now, I think chosen families exist outside of our community, but we may not recognize them that way. Um, and we may not think of them in, in such terms, especially if we have close bonds with our actual blood relatives. Um, we may not think that we've we've developed these other spheres or these other uh, circles or groupings. So that's kind of where all of this is, is coming from in that uh, aspect of things, because I was like, I actually went back and looked, I was like, have we ever talked about this before? Cause I was, I thought maybe we had and we haven't. So that's where um, this is kind of coming about is, and I want people to know that uh, part of what strengthens our entire community are these like bonds of creation that we make um, and that we establish whole other worlds of experience and existence in a way outside of the blood families that we come from. Um, perhaps for those that are adopted or that um, are emancipate, um, you know, different circumstances that they're not really connected with their families, um, they might have a similar or parallel experience. Um, but we don't necessarily know that or think about that very much. Is, is kind of my expectation or viewpoint. So that said, uh, Mr. Edward, what did, what did you put together for us? Because um, in full transparency, I had watched the TED Talk and I was like, oh, this is pretty interesting, this concept of choice and how it works in our lives. Um, and then <laughs> you put some, a whole bunch of stuff together here of – in classic like fashion as a as a researcher as a person who you know um <laughs> is is a counselor and is into this stuff uh i say stuff just loosely so yeah yeah um <laughs> i yeah so i got a, a message from gary um about chosen families uh and i was like oh yep great topic uh and you know, like I usually do, I hit the ground kind of running and was like, oh, what can I, you know, what can we talk about? And um, <clears throat> I was thinking about when I was, uh, when me and my husband went to Provincetown for our anniversary this past uh, October, mm -hmm. um, I was walking um, and I... Uh, was listening to Elton John's new album and there was this song on there called chosen family with a singer that I'm not familiar with, um, named Rina, um, Sawayama. Mm. Um, and it, I mean, it literally is exactly what it, um, what you think it, 
it is right. So the um, the uh, person who wrote the song was writing it from the lens of the LGBTQ plus experience. Um, and, you know, like some of the lyrics, uh, like it starts off like, you know, where do, where do I belong? Tell me your story and I'll tell you mine. I'm all ears. Take your time. We got all night. Um, show me the rivers cross, the mountains scaled. Show me who made you walk all the way here. Settle down. Put your bags down. You're all right now. We don't need to be related to relate. We don't need to share genes or a surname. You are, you are my chosen, chosen family. Um, so what if we don't look the same? We've been going through the same thing. Uh, you are my chosen, chosen family. And um, I think, I, I know that chosen families are, you know, whatever term that uh, I have heard a lot of different people use, like gamily or, um, you know, family of choice or, um, you know, uh, you know, my I don't know. Um, I would say chosen family, but um, <clears throat> it's something that is, I think, really unique to a lot of us um, because in a way we've had to have, we've had to create these bonds with other people um, because oftentimes those bonds are not in our family of origin, um, the term that I would let, I would use as a therapist. Um, but, you know, from like an anthropological standpoint, a chosen family are, you know, non-biological um, kinship bonds, um, <clears throat> whether they're legally or uh, not, uh, they're deliberately chosen for the purpose of mutual support and love. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I would uh, point out is that sometimes our chosen family can include our biologic or family of origin members um, as well as other people. When when I was growing up, um, there was a member of my family who I knew as Uncle Bruce. Um, he had a British accent and his, his kids had a British accents. Um, and I just thought that he was a part of our family. <laughs> Um, you know, lo and behold, uh, he was a part of my parents' um, AA fellowship, um, which is another family, um, mm. which, you know, I'm a part of. So I have, um, you know, my recovery community that I would say are very much like my family. Um, <clears throat> so this isn't necessarily something that is, you know, specific to the LGBTQ community, um, we have seen it in other, uh, you know, places like, uh, but like specifically with the LGBTQ community, community like um, we have seen it in, um, especially within um, disenfranchised communities, even like marginalized communities within our community, right? So like a lot of times you have seen, um, you know, chosen family terms, like kinship terms used um, within the ball cultures. Um, and, you know, like when we look at Paris is Burning and shows like Pose and even, you know, shows like Rent, um, they highlighted this, this concept of chosen families. <clears throat> and a lot of times these families are protective factors against forms of discrimination and violence at home and helps create those positive and hopefully secure attachments with others. I, I think it's interesting um, in, in looking at it from that lens that this is about selecting people or people selecting you or both that give you comfort, that give you safe space. Um, like my best friend from high school, we were kind of inseparable for like five years um, because they were a year behind me. And so we met by kismet, like by fate because of bus route. <laughs> um, we lived blocks from each other, but didn't know each other. Like we went to the same elementary school. It was just like one of the more odd um, coincidences of, of fate or life that we kind of just didn't really know each other until they started going to the junior high and then we um, got to know each other, became friends. And 
we kind of became our each other's sort of chosen family in a way. Um, I had a handful of friends. I was active in the band. I was, you know, one of the artistic like music kids. So I was a band. Uh, they were in choir. We were both in choir. Like, so we kind of created our own little grouping um, in those years. And I'm still friends with most of them on Facebook to this day um, in some fashion to, to know kind of what's going on in their lives. And um, actually, my best friend um, and I are still uh, from high school, still in touch now. We've, you know, we became adults. We went off uh, in different directions and paths and we're not as close as we used to be, but we still have that connection from back then. Um, and so I think back on it and I'm like, that was that was a chosen family of a sort. You know, we we came of age in the height of the AIDS epidemic, you know, in the 80s um, into the 90s. So that was a whole experience at a time in which being out was not necessarily a, a welcomed or accepted situation could, you know, have mm -hmm. uh, a negative um, consequence just to your own safety, emotionally, physically, all that kind of stuff. And then in college, I, you know, developed a, a kinship with a handful of other people. We were all in the same program when I started at university. And then and we, you know, have stayed in touch over the years um, since then. And that's also, you know, a different uh, chosen grouping. I think I think you just find kinships in, in different ways. Um, some might just think of it as purely friendships. But I think there is something different about the support that you get from other people and then how you turn up for them or they turn up for you. I think that that's more the distinction about the friendship versus the the family. I remember as a kid, as a young adult, I think it was my mother and I had this disagreement about, I, I made reference to like best friends and my mother and <laughs> was like, no, you have one best friend. Like, that's how that works. You have a best friend. There's just one. And I was like, no, I can have multiples. <laughs> and we just kind of like butted heads about this issue. I remember she distinctly was like, I have a best friend. It is your godmother. Da -da -da -da. And I was like, right. I was like, that's you. I have, other, I have other best friends. And now that I look back on it, um, my mother rest in peace, she actually developed another best friend in, in, in her life, which ended up being my best friend from high school's mother. Um, so, yeah, it, it's interesting, you know, how people want to view it, um, what they call it, what, you know, they name give to it. But I think it's important that people understand, you know, there there is some history to it um, and what it does. But I think that um, that safety, that comfort um, is a is a big piece of it as well. Yeah, the um, I think kind of growing up for me. Um, I had a lot of kinships with, like when I discovered theater, um, mm -hmm. I had a, I made a lot of really, really close friendships. Um, and, uh, also, you know, going to a Catholic grade school, um, you know, I have 13 kids in my graduating class. Uh, you know, they are very still much my you know, quote unquote, brothers and sisters, uh, we may not talk all the time, but, you know, um, I know that they're there. Um, again, I really wouldn't say kind of chosen family cause you were kind of forced into that, but, you know, once we kind of got into adulthood, we, um, you know, we, it became kind of a choice, right? Like, you know, a lot of them came to my wedding, um, and even when I was coming up with my, with the guest list, um, a lot of it was like, who's my family? Like, you know, who are the most important people who have touched my soul? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of those were disjointed. Like, you know, they were um, from different points of my life. Um, and... Um, but they were all still very much like, yes, like these are the people that I would want to witness. Um, I, I would want them to bear witness to this. Um, I would want them to hold me accountable for this decision that I'm about to make. Um, and when it comes to, you know, my, uh, 
like even like early coming out, um, there were some really, really important people. Like the first person I came out to, um, who's still a very important person in my life, um, you know, and a couple other people. I just uh, reconnected with somebody that I was very close to early in my gayness, <laughs> my outness. Right. Um, and yeah. Um, and I had like, we lost contact. Um, and this is before, you know, this is before I had a self is kind of before the whole cell phone thing. And, um, we lost contact. Uh, and I really miss them. Uh, and for years I was like, low key looking for them. And I finally found them last year. Uh, and I sent them a message and I was like, Hey, I don't even know if you remember me. Um, but you know, I have been looking for you for years. Um, and it was right when Abba's new album came out. Um, he was very pivotal in, in me kind of learning Abba and, um, I was like, listen, like, you know, I just want you to know, like, what impact you have had on my life. And, you know, I only I kind of looked at you like the big brother I didn't really have growing up. And, um, you know, if you want to be a part of my life, <laughs> you know, awesome. If you even read this, I don't know. But he got back to me. And, you know, we are trying to make plans to get together. Um, he lives a couple hours away. Um which is really cool. Um, and it's nice how those relationships are very cemented, um, in time, uh, and, uh, you know, we can pick up, uh, I was just really happy that he remembered who I was. Um, he was like, how could I forget you? <laughs> um, well, that was going to be my thought, Ed. I'm like, I don't <laughs> think of you as a forgettable person. Uh, um, uh, uh. Well, no, and, and so, I mean, you know, and I get that folks may not fully understand this concept. I thought the theater community was a great analogy because having been in theater, if you've done a play or a musical, um, dramatic, like, you know, entertainment, and there's a crew, you usually bond. And sometimes, you know, it, it's it's pretty uh, much of an emotional roller coaster because you all come together for a common purpose and it's a short-term investment, and then it ends. Um, you know, the project comes to a closure, and then people find themselves, uh, more often than not, it's kind of, uh, it's not the same, but I, I've related it to, in parallel to, like, run drop. Um, you know, you go to an event weekend, and you meet these great people, and you have a great time, you know, and it's 72 hours of some of the most, like, intense you know, stuff that happens because, you know, you're able to meet other people and hang out and you haven't seen them in, in however long and or meet new people and you blow off steam and you have so much fun and then like it all just ends. Um, and in that, I can see where, you know, these are these are little pockets. It's something similar in what we're talking about in terms of chosen family. You know, these are connections and bonds that you're making with other people. You find support in them. Um, and. Uh, I think for us as a, the LGBTQ community, we established the chosen family out of necessity because in – at least in American history, um, you know, I'm going back to like uh, kind of pre-Stonewall – um, you know, like to the Mattachine Society, to these, you know, groups where it was not supportive by the American public to be gay or to be lesbian mm -hmm. and to be out. Um, you could be disowned. You could be, um, you know, fired from your job. You could be unemployed. You could kind of basically be ostracized by society. And having a chosen family gave you the ability to have a place to rest or fall softly, maybe. And we did it again in the height uh, of the AIDS epidemic. 
in Mm -hmm. the 80s. The communities came together because we felt abandoned by the medical community and the science community and by government and politicians. We felt that we were not being valued. We felt devalued. Um, Mm -hmm. And then, interestingly, I really felt that the bear community did that as well. Uh, as as it is looked upon in certain uh, concepts of the history of the bear community, you know, we after World War II, we end up with the leather community that comes out of that um, military men come, returning to the U.S., discovering this camaraderie with other men and, and an opening, an awakening of their sexuality. Out of that, we get into the 80s and the HIV AIDS epidemic and the hyper masculine focus that comes about in the 80s with, you know, short shorts and ma- um, Magnum PI mustaches and, you know, um, having abs and tanned bodies and all this kind of stuff. And there was a segment of the MSM, the um, same gender loving community that was like, but I don't fit in with this. And where do I go and what do I see? So all of this stuff kind of confluences together. And we end up with men who appreciate other men and they start gathering together in some of the bigger cities and developing these small social networks. But they're not necessarily leather and they're not necessarily, you know, um, which for a term for a while was like gym bunnies. You know, they were they were they were just guys um, and they represented kind of the everyman. So they're, you know, tradesmen, they're law enforcement, they're like they, they, they kind of represent a blue collar kind of uh, imagery. I'll put it that way. And so the bear community ended up being kind of creating its own chosen family in some ways, because even within our own gay community, we still didn't necessarily feel that we had a space or a place. And so that's coming to back around to what I was saying in the beginning about with Brian, um, you know, podcasting was a whole new thing that had come about, you know, since the beginning of the millennium. And mm-hmm. we're one of the longest standing podcasts at this point. And, you know, I knew about B talk. Um, you know, there were, there were these other podcasts that I listened to before coming to Cubs out loud that were around and we all kind of got to know each other in some ways and tried to meet up and the way we usually a meet up was at a bear event or something of that sort, like, you know, um, one of the bigger, more national ones. And so I think we, we coalesce, we kind of find our tribe basically, as it's been said, and we create our home within that, um, and have those bonds. And I don't know if that really exists still to this day, one of the things I've thought about from time to time is how with the advancement of equity, you have less need for these type of things to exist because as we were talking about, you weren't supported or included. So you made your own thing with other like people. But if you don't need to do that anymore, it makes sense to me where there may be less of that bonding, so to speak. So chosen families may be less of a thing, or we may have felt about six plus years ago were less of a thing. And the reason I say that is the past handful of years have rapidly changed a lot of things. And Mm -hmm. I know that in here in America, we're dealing with a lot of things right now in the political realm with the legal system about rights and individuality and respect. Um, And some people are kind of probably having some PTSD feeling like we're having a weird throwback to the eighties experience um, for conservatism and those type of um, perspectives about what is, you know, acceptable and what is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's why I kind of said about the time frame because I feel things really are changed now in, in 2022. I think we, in the U.S. had a political administration that I think in time to come, my perspective is we will say, wow, look at what got unearthed because we might not have been willing to recognize or to know 
about all of this existing around us before. And now it's in our face. And there was, a, I think, initially some reluctance to n- acknowledge that this was always there. I think there was a, like, where is this coming from? And why is this cropping up? And da da da. And it's like, oh, no, no, honey, baby, this, this was always here. This wasn't, like, I think there was some talk about backlash against political correctness um, and those type of things. But I'm mm-hmm. like, mm, I really think that there has been a huge, uh, change in terms of people, in terms of like disenfranchisement, like that they feel that they're not seen and they're not heard and they realize that they can come forward and that they have a voice. And the difficulty, the challenge, the, um, I don't know, like the butting of heads maybe right now is accepting and understanding everybody can feel that way. Yeah. Like when you're in the minority, You don't ever think of the majority feeling put out or displaced. But in theory, if if things change and there's more equity, true equity, there will not be majority. So that kind of flips things on its head. And and so, uh, yeah, I think there's been interesting coalescings of groups and things that have come together. But anyways, I feel like I'm getting into a whole anthropology thing. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) No, but you, you actually bring up a really good point, and I'm glad that you – I really appreciate that you uh, talked about um, the less of a need for um, for that because of increasing, um, you know, social acceptability. Um, I think that uh, if we are talking about chosen families, uh, and to kind of talk about – full disclosure, I didn't watch your – watch the um the ted talk that you said um however with the subject of choice um that uh signifies some kind of action that is being taken and i think for um you know i know for me uh when i was you know a new gay um the person who i came out to um brought me to my first gay bar and I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And, you know, he was very quick to remind me, listen, these people are not your friends. These are just people at a bar. Um, they are not mm. your friends until you hang out with them outside of this place. Um, so here's the thing. So we had these places where we, where we go. So you were also talking about the bear community, right? We have these bear runs. We have these places where we can converge, right? Where it becomes like, um, you know, forced uh, interaction, right? It doesn't become a choice until that's over. So um, when we have things like social acceptability, when we have things like the, the decline of gay spaces or queer spaces, it becomes a choice what we do with those relationships that we have inside those those bars. And then we have, you know, we have uh, social media, right? So that that is a, you know, as frustrating as it can be, it is a great, really good platform to um, nurture and sustain some of those uh, relationships that we may have lost, um, ver- you know, in, in actual, like, in place, physical space. And uh, we kind of saw that, but what I have seen is that we were quickly reminded of how much we need each other these past three years or past two years. Um, You know, when we could not get together, we we had to choose how to uh, foster those, uh, those relationships. Um, and it became a choice rather than an expectation rather than, Oh, I'll just see you there. I'll just see you at TBRU. I'll see you at dredge fur. I'll see you here. Right. It became like an actual, like, no, 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 no. If I want to see you, if I want to experience, I have to call you. I have to text you. I have to FaceTime you. I have to, I have to hang out with you in, um, you know, on, on animal crossing. (laughs) Whatever the case may be, um, if I want to interact with you, I have to choose um, a way to do that. 
I think it, you bring up an excellent point about the difficulty that uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic brought on the world and how it also had a whole other layer of impact on our communities. Because I agree with you that, like, I, what I wanted to say was that the, it is a choice to go to these events. And yet it is also, I hear you, a choice at the conclusion to stay connected, to continue on. And mm -hmm. in that is where you create more connection with people. And so I'm thinking back on how during the midst of COVID, I'm meeting with people that I care very much about and we're just hanging out and playing virtual video games basically and passing the time doing things for me it was a way to stay connected to people also a stress relief like brain break because i worked the entire time where the folks i was engaging with all of them were pretty much laid off for some period of time some longer than others and this was a way for them to do something other than yeah stare at walls or watch YouTube or at the time Pornhub or whatever was going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, Owen said something in the live chat I thought was interesting. He said, chosen family is kind of a shared experience across minorities and those who are othered. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Owen. I've been talking about being othered quite a bit recently, especially in, in the workplace because I've been explaining to folks, like I said to one of my coworkers recently, who is a, a um, person of color, I would never presume to know what a life experience is like for a person of color. I just, I can't. That is not, those are not shoes I can walk in. I can attempt an imagination, but it, it will not give it like due diligence or full credit. Like it, it's just, it, it, it's like, why bother? And I did say in that conversation to them about this idea, I cannot imagine what it is like to live the life of a person of color. However, we may find connections or commonalities because we may have had experiences in being othered, being discriminated against, being hate crimed, being um, treated a specific way because of who we are in, in certain realms. And I think that that's what brings certain populations of people together. And I was sort of having a conversation about politics. And I said, what I think people forget about or find difficult is in this landscape where these, you know, judicial legislative things are happening. If you have not had this direct experience on being on the receiving end of whatever it is, then you really can't understand the scope of the impact unless you have been othered if you have been like declined restricted you know removed taken out of you know whatever it is had had a negative consequence of something you and it had an, an impact in your life you then may be able to understand others it doesn't mean you fully get it but you may be able to comprehend and say oh i too have had xyz happen to me it is in my mind something like not the same but do you know what i mean and, and it creative kind of creates a, a connection in that way so I, I think it's interesting that um owen is basically saying um how you know, minorities um, or other groupings of people who are not in the majority basically create chosen family uh, groupings in some fashion. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, like I didn't um, I didn't put it in here, uh, but there is some really cool qualitative uh, research on chosen families among um, African American LGBTQ plus communities, um, and you know, because it has such, um, deep, um, like cultural, uh, importance, um, mm -hmm. and something that is, um, very unique, um, to a, um, 
uh, to that lived experience because people, you know, with privilege, right, um, like, you know, have these these experiences, which are they're, you know, they're they're speaking from, um, and they, you know, like you said, they, um, a lot of times they can't really relate, and oftentimes those shows and families or those relationships are not seen as valid. Um, and not seen as important um, because they're not blood um, related. But, um, you know, that comes from a very heteronormative, um, like patriarchal, you know, uh, lens that <laughs> is just not, you know, it's just not, it's, it's not the thing. <laughs> No, and, and I completely agree with you, Ed. I was just thinking about the disagreement my own mother and I had about this concept, this idea of the importance you give to other people and how the difficulty can be for your your family of origin, for your blood family, the family that you were raised with, how you may put others above them. Because that's something I remember that was a bit of a consternation. My My mother was just not understanding how I could have friends, quote unquote, that I valued more than my own blood family, so to speak. And it's like, well, no offense. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was just thinking about the latest Drag Race episode. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> But the reality is, these individuals understand me on a level that this other group doesn't. And um, all, mm -hmm. we, we connect on a way in a, in a thing that they may never understand. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. and I never really figured out a way or thought of how I could better communicate that. It wasn't an ongoing like debate with us or anything, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, even from like an anthropological, um, like this is, this is something that has been studied like cross culturally, like even among, um, you know, primates, right? Like these chosen families uh, are present, right? Like um, even um, what am I thinking about? Um, even among uh, like societies where um, it's about like community, like communal communities, right? Like, you know, uh, there are a bunch of, uh, like there's this concept called like alloparents, uh, meaning that like these are people that are, are your parents, but they are people that are, can be seen as your parents, right? Or as like people who are not really your relatives, but can be seen as, um, people on your level, like cousins, right? And and there are a lot of, um, like, that's very prominent in communities where um, you say, oh, that's my cousin, right? They're not really your cousin. They're just like, that's just like somebody, I'm connected to them, right? Um, and so it's just really funny to me that um, even in, like, you know, minority communities, right, where that... Um, kinship uh, patterns are very prevalent and also um, historically sound, right? Like we have seen that through ages, right? But like where from like a, um, a European lens, right? Like that's something that's unique to that. That's very like, no, you know, you stay in these lanes and these boxes, blood is... Um, blood is more important than not blood. I don't know how you want to say that. No, I, I think you bring up an interesting point. I was just thinking back to, um, for those of you that watch RuPaul's Drag Race, and if you're watching the current season 14, there was this moment uh, in the early part of the season where they were talking about the aunties. And yeah. so these drag queens, a couple of them are kind of the more uh, maternal spirits, so to speak, in personality. And so the aunties were like, you know, uh, having a little kiki and like, you know, telling jokes and being silly and funny and yet also being wise to some of the younger queens. And it was making me think about how, as it tends to happen, 
a lot of things in the drag community get poached or borrowed, stolen, taken, um, copied, whatever, from the BIPOC community. Right, absolutely. And mostly from the Black community, which is where mm -hmm. I have heard the term auntie like for decades now at this point. In my previous career in telecom, that was one thing that I heard all the time was about this is, you know, that's my aunt or and being an ignorant white boy, like, I don't know any different. So I'm busy thinking, like, there's a lot of people in this place related to each other. Not really. Like, not blood related, but they have connections to each other. Could be church, could be community, something of that sort. Um, you know, speaking of drag, like, there's, there's a lot of, like, reference to, like, this is my sister. Well, they're not really related. They're not yeah. from the same drag house. They're just codifying like they're they're taking that relationship and giving it a label that is commonly used in other references like for so, the yeah they're making it important well and, and for a long time we used to say this is the bear brotherhood i think that that's really gone by the wayside because like any community that gathers and comes together it is a blend of all the people and as we've experienced over the past decade um, it's been known for quite a long time, but I think it's been rising more and more up is that, you know, the bear community isn't without its own criticism. It creates a classist system, mm -hmm. you know, unintentionally and us versus them, uh, you know, and more importantly, that we were not being open in terms of equity to space and recognition. And that still to this day needs to be dealt with and addressed uh, in some ways. Get yeah, the... Um... Uh, I was just about to say something and I can't remember. Oh, uh, about making it important, right? So like even within recovery communities, you know, you typically have a sponsor, right? Um, now this isn't a concept that I adopt. Um, I, I don't think that it's something I think is helpful, but like within, uh, with your sponsor, right? If your sponsor is sponsoring somebody else, that is your sponsor sibling, right? Um, and you mm. have sponsorship families okay. um i mean i could that's a, that's neither here nor there but um you know i i don't think that's um always the best because then within families you have different traditions and you know stuff and sometimes those traditions go against the fellowship traditions and that can get really messy um but it's what I have seen, it's it's about making meaningful relationships within your community because for a lot of people, it's the first time that you have been able to have these relationships and to have a, say, a mother or a father or a, a brother or a, or a sister or an uncle um, where you're like, oh, this is what that is. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I never had this before. This is cool. Right. And it means something. Family's really important to people. I, I think what family provides is structure and a sense of acceptance, support, placement, support. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It gives you a great many things. And I think in the time of COVID, that really was challenged. Not only was it challenged just globally the world over, but even, in, you know, more specifically in our own subset community. Yeah, I have a, I have friends who work on college campuses, right? And a lot of them are uh, part of the diversity and inclusion um, department, right? So they are running the LGBTQ programs and uh, they were very, very stressed because a lot of their students were having to go back to their home um, their family of origin where there isn't any support. And sometimes that is not a, um, that is not a safe place for them. So, you know, having to uh, struggle to find them, uh, you know, maybe temporary housing or, um, you know, like support. Um, COVID really damaged a lot of the chosen family uh, structure. Um because it definitely put people in increased or potentially increased violence and stress situations. Um, and during COVID, uh, the Trevor Project released a uh, survey on um, a lot of LGBTQ plus 
youth, uh, primarily uh, individuals like BIPOC individuals. And, um, and they found some really good, uh, really good results about the need for support and, you know, the need for even families of origin to be supportive of one's identity um, and, and the need for chosen families. Um, so yeah, uh, COVID really did a number on uh, the LGBT community, community when it came to chosen families. And I think uh, in an addition to that, one of the things that I was made aware of during the time of COVID was the unsafe conditions people found themselves in because they couldn't go anywhere. So if you were in a unhealthy home environment, possibly there was domestic violence or sexual assault, mm -hmm. but you had nowhere to go. Like you weren't working, nothing was open. You had no place, like you had no respite. And I don't think some people realize that was what was happening. People going to jobs, people going to school, people having these opportunities to break away was actually a relief or a break in whatever the home environment could end up being. And I think that also happened for youth that they could get away for eight hours a day or whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, I, I understand that even in, you know, higher ed, there, there was a, a whole pocket of individuals that I will admit my home life here where I live now was very different than where I went to college, which was just, couple hours away drive time but it was a whole different world that i was living with a whole different group of people and my personality and my behavior were very different there versus here during breaks mm -hmm. yeah um and then you know like the other thing that i or the other topic that i um found in relation to that is these chosen families um while they are like really important, you know, we've, we've been talking about how for a lot of people, they are, um, you know, supportive and they can be really helpful. Um, they're not a lot of times recognized. Um, so, yeah. you know, if I need surgery and I don't have a supportive family, um, nobody can take leave, um, to come help me if I need it. So, um, the, the one thing that I found was that uh, there are some large states, right, some metropolitan areas that are offering uh, leave, paid time off um, for you to care for anyone that may that you define as family, uh, whether that be related by blood or affinity, um, like New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, St. Paul, Minnesota, um, like Arizona and Rhode Island. Uh, even like Austin, Texas, but um, even in Austin, Texas, lawmakers are trying to block that uh, so that um, that that doesn't happen based on, you know, LGBTQ discrimination. Um, and I think that's great. However, um, you know, that leaves a large majority of the country uh, unprotected. Mm hmm. I think it's interesting as you bring up this concept. Yeah, it, it makes sense because so for work with my own leave policy, we have different categories. One of them is sick leave. What I find interesting is within our sick leave, there is a sub set, I guess, or a recognition that your sick leave may be for family purposes, not just for you. So what that means is I we have a policy, and I think it's up to 60% or 80% of our sick leave can be used for family. So that means if you are a parent and you have children and you need to take your children to the doctor or your child is, is sick and you need to stay home with them. Um, for me, I've used it with my father as a caregiver. The It, it was really interesting to qualify that. And I didn't know that there was a thing when I started, it was just sick time. So I just presumed it was when I was <clears throat> sick. So mm -hmm. then to find out, I was getting questioned, 
was this for personal or sick or, or family? And I was like, I don't understand what you mean. And they're like, oh, well, you can use up to this percentage over the course of a year for family. It qualifies as family sick time. And I said, I didn't know there was such a thing. And they said, well, there isn't. And I was very confused that we had, well, I mean, they really had to kind of spell it out for me. So instead of creating two pools or buckets or categories, it's all just one, but you can qualify it and then they track it. So it's like an added benefit to the benefit, I guess. Sure. But what I find interesting is there's no documentation. Like, like I don't have to produce anything to show that I went to, that I took my father to a doctor's appointment to, or anything oh, like thank that. Goodness. Well, now I, I need to recognize that like, I'm not asking for extended time. Like I'm not asking for, three days. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a half a day or a whole day. It's kind of random. So it's not as if I'm taking off extensive time because we do have a policy that if you're having extensive time, you may be requested for documentation purposes, whatever that mm. may be, especially when it comes to sick time and as opposed to like your vacation or personal time, which are other categories. So I, I find this interesting because theoretically – I could use my – like my employer would not know the difference because they don't require the documentation. So I could theoretically use my sick time for family without telling them that it is my chosen family if I wanted to. That's good. So very interesting. Yeah. Um, so – so yeah, so chosen family is really important. Um, Jeff, you know, you really need to shut up. <laughs> you guys are having a great conversation. I didn't have anything to add, so. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. That's all right. I'm smiling still. <laughs> Jeff always smiles when he's given a hard time. <laughs> wow. Brown chicken, brown cow. Anyways. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, resources, is that what some of this is here as we're wrapping up, Ed? Yeah, I mean, you know, like always, I... Uh, I linked a lot of uh, a lot of articles here. The 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 2021 Trevor Project survey, which I think is a really great resource. Um, also, that song um, by um, Rena um, Siwanyama and uh, Elton John, and also there is a another link from the. Um, uh, periodical them and it is a list of uh, articles or blogs that include content on the topic of chosen fa chosen families and there is like articles there about different movies that you can watch that focus on that topic or um you know uh some like ethnographic uh you know meaning like you know narratives from LGBTQ individuals um, on the topic of chosen family. So uh, I thought that was a really good uh, list. I've not, I don't recall hearing about this. Is this like, it kind of seems like a webzine? Them. Yeah, US? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to call it. Um, what do you call it? It, it looks like a digital magazine, basically, but it appears to okay. be specifically the LGBTQ plus community from what I'm seeing. Yes. Because I'm seeing uh, lots of stuff about those topics. Interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. they talk about drag. They talk about politics. They talk about trans stuff. They talk about gay, lesbian entertainment. They talk about Dolly Parton wanting to do a rock album. <laughs> I mean, it's just. Yeah, it, it's like a, it's pulling together these different items for, for folks as a one-stop kind of location in terms of news and, and items. Interesting. 
Yeah. Um, I have, I you know, whenever that pops up, I, I have, uh, I think that they have produced some really good content. Yeah. I mean, looking at their website, they have culture, entertainment, news, health, style, shop. So what is shop? Is this, is this their merch? I think so. We'll see. Or <laughs> it's, it's either their it's either their merch or the things that they're hawking on behalf of because they get something for it. Yeah, it's their merch. <laughs> That's fun. They have it. It's called the Village Tea. It's very hippie, like graphic-y kind of letters um, in a rainbow thing, and it says, "Are you one of us?" Mm. What of us? What of us? What of us? Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, the this particular tag list is interesting um, because it talks about like all sorts of different items um, within the grouping. But like, this looks interesting. How the potluck became an essential tool for building queer community. Mm. Yeah. The strength I felt caused playing as Shira with my queer chosen family. Right. Wow. Um. What was the Oh, yeah. And, you know, there's uh, on the topic that we've talked about surviving COVID-19 has meant suppressing my non-binary identity. Um, uh, There uh, appears to be a holiday live stream celebration um, with icons like Angelica Ross from Pose, Bob the Drag Queen, Peppermint, uh, Chris and Stewart, Tegan and Sarah, and um, how they reflect on the meaning of chosen family and what they have had to say. Uh, So... Um, wow. I think this is a, a really cool um, list. I agree. Yeah. Um, there's a thing on there. It's from 2018, though. These nine laws are forcing employers to acknowledge chosen families. Yeah. Good stuff. Are you one of them? Sign up for our newsletter. <laughs> Yeah, the way the way they campaign that. <laughs> I'm gonna sign it with my email because I'm intrigued to see with it what I get in the newsletter. By the way, if you didn't know and you heard uh, Ed and I use the reference of BIPOC, B I P O C, it stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Um, you in academia and in uh, social work, uh, so to speak, with therapy and and being a therapist and that, I with public health. We are in spheres, which most industries now, I call it alphabet soup. We have a a new public health educator, relatively new, who constantly was reminding me recently. They're like, wait, what's that mean? And what's that stand for? And what's this other thing? (laughs) Because we we say stuff all the time and we kind of forget that not everyone's up to date or knows what these abbreviations stand for. Like I've – so what's interesting in the field of public health – Total divergence because we're wrapping the show. Uh, one of the interesting things is discovering that the CDC is attempting to make a pivot and it, it's going to have profound impacts in the future about SOGI, which is sexual orientation, gender identity, because these things have not been properly data captured in medical slash public health spheres. There is a presumption of a binary. There is a presumption of certain things and the difficulty of that, like how you pull the data out of it so that you can say this is how it impacts our communities. If you can't capture the data to begin with, then you can't really like substantiate a theory or a concept. Mm -hmm. Um, And I find that very interesting. I think about how my best friend told me a story of how several times now they've gone to a new PCP and the PCP starts talking to them about, you know, reproductive health and, you know, birth control and having, you know, exams to make sure that, you know, everything's in working order. And they have to consistently say, no, no, no. Well, you never know. You might be pregnant. No. <laughs> like they kind of and then uh. eventually they out themselves. They finally have to say, my wife. And even then, sometimes mm-hmm. it doesn't kind of click, I guess which is a little disturbing, you know, and, it, and it's about like the education process of those, you know, those industries, those spheres to say, hello, there's, there's more than just 
white people. There's more than just straight people. So, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Well, thanks, Ed. Yep. I think this was really good. Um, I appreciate the, the insight and all the, the resource and information that we discussed. Of course. I, uh... Mm-hmm. What's that, Jeff? Are the family Madrigo? Families are always good when they're chosen. <laughs> it's interesting, Ed, that you went with the new Disney Encanto like musical reference because I immediately thought of the Birdcage and the finale musical number when they're trying to get the secret identity people out oh. of the club and they're busy doing we are family, family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i was singing that earlier today um and how the you know queer community definitely co-opted a lot of uh, music uh in order to uh identify their family specifically that song mm-hmm. too true we but, tend to overlay meaning on things that are not the in- initial intention no yeah because we make a connection we don't do that. That. yeah we don't do that <laughs> i think that, i think that's been diminishing though with the with well, the i mean as yeah well, I was going to say, with the rise of like celebrities, artists, recognition within industries of of the queer community overall, I think there's less and less like, yeah, like absorption and and you know overlaying of you know this is that and so on and so forth because we don't quite need to do that. Yeah, I mean they still do that, like especially with um, like queer coding and. Um, there's a word I can't think of. Um, what do you call it when you... Oh, shipping. Oh. Mm-hmm. You know about shipping? Um, and handling? What's handling? <laughs> I'm so glad Jeff laughed. <laughs> that was a joke. Shipping and oh. handling. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did a horrible dad joke and Ed just whoosh, didn't even catch it. I just, I, I fell right the hell into that one. And that was good. You get an applause. <laughs> oh, you know what? Actually, you like... you're going to get hyped. Hold on, ready? <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. That was good. That was that was really good. That's oh, funny. with that. Does mine even still work? Hang on. Oh no, it doesn't work. I have to. Re- oh, you're gonna have to get another one. No, I'm gonna have to put batteries in it. Anyways, mine's something different. Mine's the original, but that's another issue. We'll discuss it at, at another show. That's a button <laughs> that I use with my. Um, I use it with my clients when they do something awesome. They get hyped. That's cool. That's very mm-hmm. nice to do. Nice. And with that, uh, I would say that's that's the end, folks. I'm sorry. Oh. Well, anyways, to contact us, tell us about your own chosen family. You can do that in plenty of ways, such as going to our blog at comesoutloud.com. You can shoot us an email at comesoutloud at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 361 we'll talk. That's 361 265 8255. You follow us over on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at Cubs Out Loud in the appropriate place of the URL. Join our entourage chat and chat about your chosen families at tinyrealcom slash telegram dash col. You can follow our Google Calendar at tinyrealcom slash calendar dash col to find out when we're planning on recording these shows. Shows you can also get Vegas accoutrement, such as a Cubs Out Loud shirt that our guest Edward Angelina Cook is wearing. Or a cassette is my foreplay shirt, which Gary is wearing. Hard, hard to see because the camera's getting off, but that's beside the point. Um, or a hat, or even one of our older logo shirts, like I'm wearing. 
um, all over at Zazzle at Zazzle.com slash Cubs Out Loud. That consents of my foreplay shirt and many of our other designs was designed by Smashy, which you can find more of his designs over at his T Public store at tpublic.com slash use slash Smashy the Bear. Uh, if you would li like to support us, you can also do that through Patreon at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud, or you can send up some cash at paypal.me slash Cubs Out Loud. You can find us on various uh, podcasting platforms where you can rate us, review us, whatever you like. Uh, that's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, um, uh, Spotify, Amazon Audible. Find me anywhere in the internet. Box up, box puppy, box cub, box something or other, or Windjump, W-Y-N-D-G-E-M on Twitch, where this past week I fucked up and forgot to check my settings on my uh streaming and bears and dragons are missing the players audio especially considering i did a little special segment where uh i celebrated uh one of my players wedding that was that day so congratulations to dustin and josh for getting married on thursday yay hey um and uh, I, I, I did a reference to our previous campaign that he was also in, and he had a husband in that one. So we were, we were because this campaign takes five years. It takes place five years before the, before the first one, and there was a five year. They celebrated their five year wedding anniversary during our first campaign. So at the wedding for this one, it was just like a brief thing. Uh, any case, Gary, where can people find you? If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GareBear73. And Mr. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find me uh, on uh, Facebook, I'm Edward AC. Uh, you can also find me on uh, Instagram as Unicub underscore sex wizard. And uh, I'm on TikTok as Unicub79. Um, and yeah. And with that, I forgot to do this. Take it out, everybody. Have a good one, y'all.